Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, day nine of the States of Change Learning Festival. Uh, I'm Brenton Caffin. Um, welcome. Uh, I, our panel today are all coming from Singapore, but I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Karamank people. And so I'd like to pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging from here and wherever you may be joining us from. So uh, just to let you know uh, how things are going to work, um, some of you have already found the chat function. Um, please feel free to jump on there and let us know where you're calling from, uh, joining us from. Um, we're particularly interested uh, to get a bit of an idea of the split between, uh, if you like, locals from Singapore and people from around the world. Um, so we know just how much of an insider conversation this is going to be. Um, so I'll keep an eye on that. Um, we also have a Q&A function. So if you've got a really curly question uh, to ask our panelists, feel free to put it into the Q&A and uh, you can upvote uh, questions that you think are pretty good uh, with a thumbs up and then we will try and feed some of those questions in. Um, in terms of timings, um, so we've got four, uh, I, I wanna say dinner guests. We, we, we want this to be a little bit more informal than a panel. Um, but uh, we don't have any food or, or wine. So, um, but think of this more like a, a dinner party conversation than uh, a, a webinar, particularly for those of you joining at the end of the day. Uh, and thanks for hanging in there. Um, each of our, uh, our, our, our dinner guests are gonna join us for uh, have an initial sort of five to seven minutes to uh, riff on the topic uh, that we've set for them, which is how Singapore learns. And it's amazing how many different ways you can interpret those three words. So we're gonna have three fascinating uh, initial interventions on that, uh, that uh, uh, theme. Uh, and then from there, we're pretty much going to uh, freeform and try and join, connect some of the dots uh, from those conversations and feed in uh, all of your thoughts uh, from the chat and from the Q&A. So um, without further ado, um, Nicole, do you want to bring our, bring our guests to the table? And we'll see how this works. All right, so uh, I'd love you to say hello to Jeanette, Aaron, Cheryl, and Shaw Fan. Um, I'm not gonna do bios because hopefully you've read those on the website. Suffice it to say that these are all very, very interesting and amazing and impactful people and you're gonna learn an awful lot. Uh, and I'm not setting too high a bar for you at all. Um, so I guess um, one way of sort of framing this, this conversation is, uh, you know, many of us, and particularly those of us who have um, worked across different countries have, at different times, uh, stumbled across the sort of Singapore model. We've heard little bits about it. Some of us have had the fortune of doing some work in, in country. Um, and we are very, very aware of um, sort of Singapore's reputation for open, th open thinking, futures thinking, uh, agility, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and I guess, uh, Singapore was also one of the first countries uh, outside of China to really uh, ride this sort of first wave of, of COVID and uh, certainly uh, from where we were sitting in Australia were uh, fascinated about how diligently um, and how uh, quickly Singapore mobilised to really sort of deploy lots of its different um, strengths to trying to understand and then respond uh, to the crisis. So given this is a three-week festival of learning, um, we thought we'd try and sort of have a bit of a look under the hood as to how Singapore does it, how it learns. Uh, and as I say, we can interpret that on many, many different levels. How it learns as a country, how it learns as people, how it learns as a public service, um, how it learns from history. Um, and if I say any more, I'm going to start stealing people's thunder. So without further ado, Jeanette, how does Singapore learn? Over to you. Thanks very much, Brenton. Thanks very much to you and States of Change for the invitation to dinner. Um, even without the wine, I love having these conversations and getting to hear and share different perspectives. So I hope that the chat and the Q&A function will be as active as the insanity up here on, on the Zoom stage. Uh, I'm a career public servant. And so I've always done foresight work in the context of public policy. I never really thought about that until I was asked at a recent panel uh, whether there was a Singapore School of Foresight, and if so, what those characteristics would be. Uh, and one of the associations that came up very strongly in the discussion was the notion that the Singapore School had a distinct public policy orientation. And because of this motivation, 
um, we have a set of a particular set of lenses and mental models when we think about the future. So with that in mind, I thought I'd say a few words about um, how the Center for Strategic Futures work fits into public policy. Um, and of course, this is, this is all uh, thinking that has evolved over time and with change in practice. But uh, there are a few main ways, three main ways in which we think about foresight um, and how it has a role to play in strategic planning. Uh, we characterize these ways as a scout, a challenge, and a grow function. Some of you will have heard us, I, I noticed a lot of familiar names in the audience, so uh, some of you will have heard us talk about this before. In the scout function, we look for emerging weak uh, signals of change in the environment and do deep dives to try and understand these issues um, and implications for public policy as these trends develop and see if these, cha these changes might portend disaster or present new opportunities for Singapore. Over time, we've developed a set of tools and habits of mind that help us to accomplish this challenge function. And they're not entirely what you might imagine um, at first, kind of first blush. We have, of course, gathered a wide range of uh, futures methods, and we all have our favorite tools, which we pull out of the toolkit uh, at every given opportunity, that help us to do the content work but just as important as the methods is ensuring that we have different perspectives uh, in the room when we think about these issues. Uh, to that end, we highly value and work very hard at building our international network of thinkers and doers, many of whom are also in this, in this Zoom room today, um, who come from a really wide range of backgrounds and disciplines, who by generously sharing their view of the world and how they think it is changing, help us to rethink our own worldview. Uh, and we very, very much um, enjoy these conversations. One example of how much we enjoy these uh, conversations is that we have the very civil, civil servanty way of approaching things and convene meetings. Um, together with the RAS team at our National Security Coordination Secretariat, uh, the center hosts a biennial Singapore Foresight Week, where we bring together all our international community of friends, uh, foresight practitioners, experts in different fields, and we sit together for a few days to collectively puzzle over what we think some of the big challenges societies will have to face over the next few decades are and how we might want to approach them, um, tackle them, subdue them, whatever the metaphor uh, of the week might be. Um, Aaron and I were having a discussion earlier about the war metaphor and how that gets rolled out a lot when we talk about COVID, for example. Um, the second function that we have, the challenge function, where futures is a tool that's used to rethink prevailing assumptions, stress test existing strategies, or develop new strategies as the landscape changes. This is the space where we have found our traditional strength in scenario planning to be tremendously helpful, uh, particularly because the scenario planning process, which is fairly um, well-structured and disciplined, provides us with many opportunities or on-ramps to bring our stakeholders along on a future's journey with us um, and give them a stake in the outcome. Um, I know Aaron will probably talk about our future's menagerie and if he doesn't, then somebody should and then we can talk about our zoo. Uh, but this challenge function really helps with taming the black elephant, which is a cross between the black swan and the elephant in the room. Uh, in effect, we borrow the future to confront these different and difficult challenges, uh, uh, difficult conversations that we have to have about present day challenges. Uh, as with the scout function, the center has developed a bunch of valuable enablers to do this job. And we work hard uh, on what in my view is one of the most important aspects of the work, which is communication. How we communicate the work to and with our, and our stakeholders, how we engage them, and how to share ownership um, of the content and the solutions with our stakeholders. So many of the team have by force had to become skilled facilitators over time, uh, learning how to hold open spaces for difficult conversations, divergent thinking, airing of crazy ideas, uh, for radical honesty and genuine ruthless curiosity. Uh, we have also found that we've reached for useful new ways of getting our audience to engage with our work, uh, whether it be through designing immersive games, producing emotive a day in the life of videos or activities where um, our stakeholders have opportunity to create their own version of the future. The final function, which is the grow function, is about building capacity 
in the wider public service to think about foresight as a strategic capability. Um, through this, we can align how we think about the future, even as we completely disagree over what we think the future actually is going to be. Unique among the many foresight teams in the Singapore government, the CSF spends a significant amount of our time on training uh, conducted at various levels. We run a very popular course, which we very imaginatively call Future Craft 101, uh, which tackles the question of what is foresight? Where in the first half hour, we pull out the slide, you know, the, the slide with the crystal ball on it, and then we exit out and say, foresight is not crystal ball gazing. Then we talk about what foresight actually is um, and what it does for decision making. Uh, we do take a more train the trainer approach when it comes to sharing methods. Uh, we have dedicated courses that teach our favorite tools, including scenario planning, to our fellow civil servants uh, to equip, equip other teams with the useful tools they need to challenge their specific, uh, to tackle their specific challenges. We also host um, various platforms that build a community of practice within the public service, not just of fellow futurists, but of policy officers who generally operate in the here and now, the Horizon One space. Uh, but they are experts in their field who are very helpful to the foresight community in helping us to connect the change that we are seeing with potential implications um, and solutions for public policy. Some of these are informal. So we have a bi-monthly platform we call the Sandbox, which is very much like this one. We have a bunch of people in the room. We have a few speakers. And then the fun part is when we share food at the end of it. Food is a common theme in many of these platforms. Uh, others are round tables, which are curated around special, uh, specific topics, uh, deep dives, where we bring some experts and some public policy makers into the room, close the door, and have a no-holds-bars conversation. Um, and still others are focused on connecting emerging signals, producing uh, some ideas about what policy implications might be before we can take it and run with it. So those three functions, scout, challenge, and grow, to me, frame how foresight contributes to better, more robust decision making in public policy. Um, I'll stop here. I'll turn the time back over to you. We can have a discussion about some of these things later. Uh, um, and I, I should do a, a, a bit of a shout out. You mentioned the international uh, advisory group uh, of futurists that you, that you sort of check in with. Um, we've all met uh, via a WhatsApp group. So shout out to Noah's Futures Group. Uh, I'm sure he'll be pleased to, to hear his name mentioned. Um, our next dinner guest uh, is, is actually um, uh, is actually going to be quite rude. He's going to leave before dessert. Um, so, uh, so Aaron Aaron's going to come in, he's going to say his piece, and then he's going to disappear. Unfortunately, he's got a very important meeting, what happens when you're a very important person. So I'll stop talking and give you some time, Aaron, to, to say your piece. Brenton, thank you so much. Um, actually, the reason I have to leave is because I'm not very important at all, which means other people control my time. Um, but that's how it is. Uh, I also have cut sugar from my life, so that's also why dessert holds less of an attraction these days. Um, I wanted to talk about two things, um, you know, because when, we, when I first saw the topic, how Singapore learns or how any nation learns, uh, in fact, I really started asking myself, that question needs to start with the, the issue of how individuals learn and then take that learning and transfer it to some kind of organizational level. Um, you know, the nation here is made up of, of individuals, but there are many sub parts as well. And I will take a bit of a government perspective on this as well. Uh, since like Jeanette, I spent most of my life, or pretty much all of my working life in uh, the public sector. Uh, and the first group I wanted to talk about is that governments must learn from themselves, right? We need to be able to encourage our officers to undergo training that enables a deep sense of reflectiveness about the work that they're doing, about the assumptions that they're making. And part of that training involves the stuff that Jeanette just talked about, the, the idea of futures training. All of our public sector leaders, right, people who are identified as within the top 1% to 2% of, of a cohort, all of them go through training at various sets of, uh, various stages of their, their lives. Um, and at the most basic level, the first training that they do, what we call the foundation course, everybody learns uh, futures and everybody learns design thinking so that the vocabulary that they have is enabled with not just the very linear mechanistic approaches of the Cartesian sciences, but also um, the, the methods of looking at new ways of, of um, examining the world and making sure that we understand 
all the, the impacts that our assumptions have on the, the policies that we make. But one thing we've realized over time is that this training needs to be much more than just analytical. It cannot just be about PowerPoint slides. It cannot just be um, experienced civil servants coming in, telling a few stories, taking some questions and then leaving. We find that it's really important for people to actually immerse themselves in that learning. That the learning can't just be analytical. It needs to be as experiential and as embodied as possible. So one thing that we started a few years ago um, that I know, uh, you know the current team of our, some of them are currently on this call, uh, is something we call the Civil Service College Applied Simulation Training Laboratory, uh, CAST for short, right? Um, it's really a serious gaming lab, but we couldn't call it a serious gaming lab because if you call it a serious gaming lab, you won't get money for it. Uh, and the, the Ministry of Finance, you know, will not have liked the word game. Um, so we call it an applied simulation training lab instead. And the idea behind the lab is that we craft these experiential training platforms um, to provide avenues where people can learn in as immersive a way as possible. And one, ex one of my favorite examples of that is that when we put people through role-playing games or they play board games to learn about how to apply financial rules, they actually live through the experiences um, of making policy in a way that is simulated but is nonetheless real and helps them to rehearse what the options might look like when they are faced with actual situations. Um, I'm a huge fan of this. My favorite moment in, when I was working on the Applied Simulation Training Lab was we got, went through a day-long exercise on public engagement where different people had to role-play different roles of talking to citizens about whether or not they were going to redevelop some land near the, uh, the, the, the homes that these citizens had. And it was entirely simulated. Everything happened in the same room. They just broke for lunch periodically. And at the end of it, someone actually went and sat in one of the chairs and said, oh my God, I am so tired from this whole process. And then we laughed because we said, you know, you didn't have to drive around. You didn't have to go to multiple different locations. But the simulation of dealing with their whole selves rather than just an individual part um, or, you know, of their, just using their brains, for instance, was a really powerful experience. And that, I think, for me, is one of the key aspects of how the Singaporean public service learns through experiences and immersion rather than pure analysis. The other thing that I was hoping to talk about today is that I think it's really important for governments to learn from citizens, not just from themselves, because that can really create an echo chamber of policymakers and bureaucrats. But we must learn how to listen hard to what our citizens are telling us. And, and we've tried to do this in a number of different ways in Singapore because we recognize that there are many advantages that come from citizen engagement. One of the advantages is that the government doesn't have a monopoly on truth. And we therefore make sure that we learn from as wide a range of sources as possible. We also get much better ideas this way because we're not stuck with just the, the material that um, a, a bureaucrat might have from the lenses that they apply to the world. So we've done various um, you know, very large scale national um, visioning exercises. One of the most recent was something we called the Singapore Conversation in 2012. We ran something called Singapore Futures in 2015 as a way of celebrating our 20, uh, 50th uh, anniversary as a nation. Uh, we've run a few citizen juries where we've gathered uh, interested citizens on themes like how to fight diabetes or how to you know, encourage um, more relationships amongst the young. We've got one going on now that's on how we can achieve greater work-life uh, balance or work-life harmony. And those, I think, are really important such that we've actually codified some of this work in an entity we call the Singapore Together Movement. Uh, so there are a, a small team in our Ministry of Communication, Culture, Youth and Sport, which is actually in charge of building up our government capacity in how to engage with citizens. Now, there's a nice overlap between this and what Jeanette was describing on the future, because very often one of the best ways to engage citizens is to ask them what they think lies in the future. And when we do that, we enable people to collectively vision and also to learn about the difficulties of policy making and the trade-offs that are involved. I'll end with just one quick story, which is another of my favorite stories around citizen engagement. Um, there was in, in the first of the Singapore conversation processes, we got people to envision what they felt Singapore should look like in 2030. And, and one woman who was about 55, maybe, she stood up uh, towards the end and said, you know, I've learned something today because... On, for me as an individual, I want housing prices to actually rise because my, my home is my asset, right? And that allows me to increase my asset wealth. But as a mother with a son who is, you know, in his mid-20s, I really want housing prices to be as low as possible so that he'll get married, find a house of his own and get out of mine. 
Um, and then she looked at the policymakers in the room and said, I don't know how you do this because even in my own head, I cannot manage these policy tensions and trade-offs. Um, I tell that story only to say that there is a really beautiful educative function that can come about from really good citizen engagement. And it helps people, I think, to realize that if even they have to deal with these ten tensions and trade-offs, then actually the act of governance is a hugely challenging one and one that requires all of us to be involved and to keep learning. So I'll stop there and hope for some great questions. Thank you, Aaron. Um, sure, Farm. Um, we've talked a lot about the future. How do we learn from the past? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk actually about something that uh, actually Aaron and I talked about once in Oxford, uh, I think last year. Uh, Kronos the, and Kairos, the different gods of time, actually. And it, I think. One thing, and uh, especially, is to appreciate that there are different qualities of time and to be able to identify what type of time this is. This sounds really a bit esoteric. Let, let me try to describe a little bit. Okay, first is, what, are we in a world governed by what I call Kronos? Kronos is, if you don't know, the Greek god of linear, global, objective time. Time is measured by clocks. Okay, and then there's Kairos. Kairos is a great god of what I call non-linear, local subjective time, and it's measured by a big ebb and a big flow of patterns of risk and opportunity, actually. So if, if one got it wrong, so to speak, right, okay, uh, you, you'll be in a wrong context. And we talk a lot about complexity. I think what is very important to know what type of time uh, one is in. And um, so, I think futurists or people who do foresight strategies actually should, would thrive a lot when you're actually in non-linear time, okay? Because non-linear time is when you try to look for something different and new, okay? So, uh, Kairos, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Kairos here, all right? It's associated typically uh, in traditional ways as a god carrying a pair of scales, all right? He is talked about as a personification of very critical moments in time, Hinges, I think some, somebody important, like Summers or something, talk about this is a period, this is a big hinge in history right now. And these are the moments marked by risk, opportunity that's hanging in the balance, and you have winners and losers of these pivotal moments that are seized and not seized. And I'll just quote Shakespeare really quickly here, okay, from Julius Caesar, all right, that there is a tie in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. And it's those moments of time that once you identify, they can say, all right, what do I do here? And this is why history is really important. Okay? Because history and literature, okay, at the same time, it's just relive moments so that you don't have to go through it and learn through it in your own limited uh, life span on earth here. So uh, just to say how I've actually uh, tried to apply it is uh, last year, 2019, was Singapore's decent bicentennial. Bicentennial, so 200 years of our founding, but we did, we did better than that. There was a big uh, exhibition and we look back 700 years here. 700 years, and we could learn that at about 1299 or 2099 or so, there was a little ice age actually, and it changed, uh, it changed actually trade, trade flows, trade winds, et cetera. It led to the diminishing of Singapore, it led to the opening of Malacca and so on. And how do you bring some of those insights over and understand climate change today? What do you need to do differently or not? And if I talk about pandemic time today, we went, actually felt a certain uh, departure of Kronos, okay? Kronos, your ordered linear time has departed already, but we are not actually in a time of Kairos yet. Kairos is kind of, a, we are actually in a big vacuum here, a big vacuum where all the normal context of what we understand is unraveling and nothing yet has come into place. And here I, is a financial historian, Adam Toon, that I follow. He talked about this as in this year as the end of the long American 20th century, all right, which started, which started in 1916. 1916, when Wilson, uh, when he ran for president, it was the first time where international affairs were brought up, okay, as part of his election campaign. And when America uh, started to step out, okay, step out, so to speak, into the world, the W. Dante, if you like, all right, okay. And, what has happened in the past, uh, in 2001, uh, in 2008, in 2016, okay? All these could be seen as a winding down of the American century a lot more. And now what happens this year, which the pandemic has ushered in, 
is finally something new is beginning. And this is one of those hinge moments, which is exciting. Okay, but one has to understand that in this hinge moment, this vacuum, a lot of old contacts are unraveling, all right, nothing new. And we need to be very agile in this vacuum. And I can talk a lot more about that later, but I just want to put some stuff out here to talk about. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Phil Fan. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm reminded of, um, I mean, there are lots of quotes around this fact, you know, history doesn't, history doesn't repeat, but it echoes. Um, and, you know, Wait, the, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and part, of the, part of the trick here is to identify which contexts actually hold the relevant lessons for the times we're living through. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, Cheryl, welcome to dinner. <laughs> Thanks so much. And I uh, appreciate so much having, having me. Uh, it's, it's actually really lovely to be together with friends. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just to even just hear from each other is, uh, is always fun. Um, so I come from a slightly different perspective in that I think of everybody on the panel, uh, I'm the one who's no longer in the, the public service, uh, although I still do public policy uh, issues. And I think when I first, uh, when we were first talking about the panel and, and how we should set it up, you know, I think first, as a futurist, you know, the first thing that, that comes very um, uh, obvious to you is the kind of lenses by which we view the world, right? And I think explicitly all of us have said we come from mainly a public policy lens and, and mainly a futures lens as well. And that's by no means the only way of viewing learning or viewing Singapore. Um, so I think that at the back of our heads, that's something definitely we should, we should be quite uh, concerned about and kind of keep, keep in the back of our minds. Uh, and the reason why I want to talk about this idea of being transparent about the lens is precisely because that's, that's what makes learning um, also to be able to be, to think about your own thinking, right? Uh, and learn about the way that you're learning. I think those are, are kind of skills, uh, definitely crucial for the future space, but not exclusive to the future space uh, that becomes very important. And, and I think to be able to articulate what those assumptions are and then be willing to at least examine them, even if you're just taking up the rock to look under it and putting it back down again. Uh, those again are really uh, um, uh, important questions. So I think for me, um, I, I'm, I will take a little bit more of an educator view because uh, now I'm at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And, uh, and I think for me, as I transition from a public servant uh, into becoming an educator, I think Futures work became much more personal to me because uh, like many of our colleagues here, we spend some time you know, working uh, either at the Prime Minister's office or you know, in ministries where when you talk about the future, you're talking about a grand future, right? Like the national future. Uh, but when you're a student, I mean, to be honest, if you can survive your exams, you're very, you know, uh, your future might only be that, that, that far in advance, uh, that's kind of ahead of you. Um, and I think it also comes down to, I think, a point that Aaron made right in the beginning, right, which was that, that to be able to be a good learn, learner as a good learning country, you also have to be a good learning person, right? And it's kind of made up of this collective of, of individual learners. And I think that that's, that's also, to me, um, really important to start to really hone those learning skills and abilities um, and, and specifically taking the lens of futures. You know, what are some of these habits of mind that are common in the futures practice that can be translated or even democratized to kind of, you know, to a wider audience. So I wanted to talk about uh, two little projects, uh, uh, maybe three if there's time, um, uh, that we've done in the couple, last couple of years to, to maybe bring, bring in some of these points. So the first uh, project I want to talk about is uh, for two years now, I've been uh, helping out with one of our local junior colleges. Uh, so these are 17, 18 year olds and uh, kind of helping them with the extracurricular futures um, kind of module, you know. So the idea is that they have like 10 weeks to become model citizens and think about the future of Singapore. And, and these are the kinds of people who hopefully when they grow up will end up doing the kinds of jobs that Aaron, Jeanette and Trofan do, uh, you know, uh, to think about really, you know, what does it mean for the future of the country and so on. Uh, so the very first thing I do with them is a little, uh, I would say a mapping exercise. So we pretend that there's a two by two on the floor. Uh, and one, one axis is talking about uh, whether or not you have, you're optimistic, you know, or pessimistic about the future. And then the other axis is about whether or not you have high agency or low agency. And one of the things that, that happened, uh, you know, the last, last time I did this uh, little exercise was that actually quite a lot of the students clustered in the low agency uh, part of the, the, this quadrant, right? Um, and a lot of the conversation that we ended up having afterwards was a lot about like, you know, uh, what can I do? I'm only one person or like, you know, the, the climate change inequality, these are too big for me to, to, uh, 
uh, you know, kind of deal with, right? Um, and I couldn't help but feel that that I think one of the things that we are also trying to be to be a learning, um, uh, you know, individual as well as an organization. I mean, you do have to have some level of at least perceived agency. You know that that your actions matter and your actions can make a difference, and it's worth putting energy and effort, you know, into these actions to kind of try to try to change the world, right? Um, so that for me was was a very interesting kind of mindset because I think in Singapore, especially. Uh, you know, with uh, it, kind of the academic um, and the formal education system being the way that it is, it can be very, um, uh, I would say, single-minded, right? And that can be excellent in many ways, um, but can also be very devastating for students who may not, um, you know, who might do extremely well, but just not, not in that single track, um, you know, future that they're viewed in, you know, and, and are, are they able to learn enough to, to you know, invent and reinvent themselves, you know, I think that that's a real question. Yeah. Um, so the second uh, story I wanted to tell a uh, little project that we do is, uh, is an inequality walk. So uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School is a graduate public policy school. So we get about 160 uh, master's students in every year and they are from uh, all over Asia, all over the world, uh, probably about 88% international students. Uh, and one of the things we did with them last year is we ambitiously, over many, many, many sessions, took them uh, on an inequality walk. So I, I designed a, a short walk between, uh, for those of you who are, who are familiar with Singapore, uh, from Robertson Quay to Jalan Kuko. So Robertson Quay is a mainly a private uh, area. It's a very commercial area, so it's got a lot of bars and restaurants and stuff like that, right by the Singapore River. And Jalan Kuko is just right across the street, uh, and it's Singapore's highest concentration of uh, rental housing. Um, and the point of the discussion was not to, was basically just to talk about a very broad question, which is how do governments and how does the state allocate resources? In this case, housing resources, you know? Um, and the, the first introduction I say when I, when I bring them along is, when you end this thing, you will have much more questions than you have answers and good luck to you for the next two years trying to figure this out, <laughs> you know? Uh, but basically, you know, okay, can we ask ourselves, right? You know, how do we allocate resources? Is it by price? Is it by... Uh, you know, criteria, if it's criteria, who gets to decide, you know, what's the bar, you know, uh, things like that, right? And, and I feel like um, that's, what, to me, it's one of my favorite experiences or things to do, you know, every semester. And, and I feel like that for me is such an important uh, part of not only teaching and learning, but also taking it out of the classroom and also giving um, young people the tools to be able to walk anywhere in any country and still ask these kind of, in our case, big questions of public policy, um, you know, and not need that textbook, you know, um, and just being able to, to kind of experience and observe. And, and I feel that just being able to see the world in different eyes is just such a, uh, change, just fundamentally changes you as a learner as well. I think the last quick thing I will say is, um, um, really this idea of, of also having the mental agility and of thought experiments uh, and uh, Jeanette, Aaron and Chofan will be very familiar with, with this kind of work. But, uh, you know, the whole idea of scenarios is to put yourself in, in things which seem a little bit ridiculous, right? Um, so the last project I'll talk about is something we did last year uh, for our Festival of Ideas. And uh, I ran a uh, 75 young, we had 75 young people from all over Asia come to join us uh, to do a thought experiment on how to design public services for Mars. And these young people had no idea about public services or future thinking. Uh, so it was just chuck them into the deep end. Um, and what I thought was really interesting was, was, again, just exposing young people to these habits of mind, um, you know, to be able to see, see that actually, you know, the world can be very different from what, what we think it might be. And, and if we come in with this, you know, almost beginner mind, right? I think, uh, you know, the, the way that we approach these, these ideas um, and, and with this curiosity and playfulness and, and you know, kind of dynamic energy, uh, you know, can, can really bring us to a much more positive future. So the story I wanted to close on was, um, so, we, so we, we made these students run around and try to design public services for Mars, right? And uh, we had, and they all, some of them came up with scenarios about how did we end up on Mars in the first place? So there was one uh, group that um, they basically, their, their setup was that uh, some, at some time in the future, this was last year in November, uh, there was some 
there was a global pandemic and then the government decided that uh, it was as a as a there was a they were going to give universal access to a vaccine right so they gave universal access to a vaccine and then the vaccine turned out to be a population control measure right and because there was such uproar you know uh, for what this government had done you know uh, a new political party rose up and decided to lead the charge to to colonize mars <laughs> you know? so you know i mean in november i had a young student from Indonesia lying on the floor, covered in sticky dots, you know, and at the time, the scenario seemed a little bit implausible, but within a month, <laughs> you know, uh, you're like, hey, actually, you know, it's not that implausible after all, right? You know, and, and not, to dis, you know, not to dismiss this thinking that seems overly crazy or wacky or whatever, but actually to see that, hey, you know, there might be, um, there might be nuggets of truth in it, right, uh, that we can learn from and, uh, and, and yeah, kind of, help to use to create a better future. That's all I have. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, uh, at, at the risk of um, turning this into a complete free-for-all, I'm going to invite all the panel to turn their um, microphones on so that you don't feel like there's a need to be this awkward <laughs> pause before you jump in. Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> Chaos. <laughs> and this is the last word you'll hear from me uh, for the next half an hour. Um, that, that was brilliant and, and, and we've got some questions and I'll come to those in a minute and, and do feel free to keep adding some questions in, and, and or comments into the chat. Um, so many places to start and, and do feel free guys to, you know, find your own rabbit hole you want to go down. I guess I just wanted to maybe just, you know, start with the last thing I heard, which um, there was some great examples, Cheryl, um, the inequality walk and the public policy for Mars of, of what I call sort of first principles thinking. You know, you mentioned the beginner's mind this idea that how do we go back and ask some of the kind of core fundamental questions of public policy? Like, why do we do this? How do we allocate? What would we do if we were actually starting, you know, with a, with a you know, uh, red field scenario of Mars? Um, and I've just, I, and I, I guess, I try and tie two concepts together. Um, I've always been fascinated by Singapore as a nation state in a city your ability to actually think at a national level, but also you're very grounded in location. So you, you can actually have very high conversations about the purpose of a nation state, but you can also walk out into a housing, uh, you know, uh, sort of development and ask questions about you know, actually putting people into, into sort of accommodation. So, um, I don't know, I guess that's a more of a comment really <laughs> than a question, but I just, I'm really interested in this idea of um, how you, yeah, how, how do you cultivate sort of first principles thinking and, and is that something that you recognise in some of your own experiences, so maybe to some of the others, um, or have I just made, made that up? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I come into an academic institution as a practitioner uh, and, and without, uh, you know, traditional academic kind of qualifications, you know, but I think that for me, one thing I always ask myself is, you know, are we, are we trying to be a learned organisation or are we a learning organization and I think that there's a difference you know uh, in some sense you know there is a bit of a curse of the learner right you know is that the, uh, that you get stuck into a certain you know I mean let's say you talk about certain institute, like an academic institution like a university right? you get stuck in disciplinary thinking it becomes more difficult to collaborate uh, collaborate across faculties you know uh, it's a problem all around the world it's not it's, it's not um, you know but is there can we come come up with doing things uh, in a way that is you know, that makes us transparent about the way that we learn right and we can start with a blank piece of paper you know um, and that's i think that's a very, very much the philosophy of the, the inequality walk uh, and we do various uh, experiential uh, walks it's not not just this one but the idea is that can i walk anywhere right and just say you know and then have a if I was walking with Chopin, you know, on holiday somewhere, you know, can we say, to start to think about, you know, have, have a conversation about inequality in Paris, you know, like, I mean, you know, it, it, it's things like that, right? Um, and, and I think that that to me is what being uh, kind of that beginner's mind and that curiosity, that just, you know, uh, desire to learn and, and thinking from first principles becomes super important. I'll just end quickly with, by saying that we, we did, a, again, a core module, uh, uh, uncreatively named the Lee Kuan Yew School course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I come back for the first two years and did the original design of it. And, and, and again, it was very much that philosophy, right? It was not, we didn't want to just be like, oh, case studies, you know, 
um, but can you lift the director's cut version of public policy in, in this example and say, okay, you know, if we have to think about these things from first principles, you know, like how do I allocate housing, you know, you know, how does the economy grow, you know, these kinds of things, uh, and, and have a conversation from there. Then when you have a diverse classroom of people from 40 different countries, then there's a, ba there's a basis to talk, you know, uh, and, and kind of debate ideas. I might jump in here quickly uh, before I need to run. Sorry, uh, Brenton, I, I really don't want to, but I, I guess I, I will have to. But I, I wanted to say a couple of things, first of all, on first principles, because I, I thought that was a fascinating question. Um, and I think it is true that we need it. Part of what looking at the future does, part of what you know, immersive experiences do, is allow us to really go back to that set of first principles and ask ourselves, without the in additional influences from um, extraneous factors. What are the core principles that we want to have? What are the values that we live by that can guide the actions? But I would add that I, I find it hard to keep the first principles mindset throughout, partly because life is thick description, right? Um, everything happens in a context. It happens within a system. Systems are embedded in other systems. And, and there are these deep histories. There are accumulations of culture that are out there. That's why I think the immersive experiences become so important, whether they are you know, the, the walks that Cheryl mentioned, the futures exercises that Jeanette mentioned, um, or, or the kind of games that, that I mentioned in, in my uh, kind of remarks. I think we need all of those precisely because life is so thick that we need to add to the first principles and make sure that we are looking at life in all of its rich complexity. Uh, there was one question in the, the panel about why we put people in a, in a single room. And it really was a simple thing, you know, is that with games, we want to keep the learning as pure as possible. And so we have people take on different roles, but the environment is still safe where they can experiment and not feel that they're dealing with actual citizens or actual stakeholders. That comes in in the citizen engagement section, which is why I think I decided to tackle both of those topics together, you know, where the realism starts to come in and you do have actual stakeholders sharing their actual lives. And I think we need both of those things. We need the safe environments and the thick description environments outside so that we live through both of those um, and, and can gain the lessons from, from each of them. I really hope the rest of this conversation goes well. I am going to jump off now, but thanks again, Brent, for having us. And, and to the rest of the panelists, take care. I'll catch up with you guys later. And to see you Aaron. next time. Bye, Aaron. Yeah, see you. Bye. <laughs> um, the, um, so I, I, I like that point, the idea of kind of combining first principles with the messy contextual reality and sort of holding both of those in, in sort of tension as you kind of work, work your way forward. Um, I'm going to bring a question in um, that was asked by Abhishek, because um, I guess one, one bit of history that, um, that, that recent history that, that, that Singapore could lean into was the SARS experience in 2003. Um, and, and you know, many people said that gave Singapore a bit of a head start in terms of responding to, to COVID. Um, the question is, you know, um, I mean, how did you learn from SARS um, in your response and, and what lessons would you share for public policy aspirants here? So does anyone, <laughs> I'm not sure, I, I, I did actually speak to Aaron about this last week in Victorian uh, conversation. So. At least when he's not going to repeat himself because he's not here. But does anyone else have some <laughs> thoughts about how Singapore learned from SARS? So I have a view. This is my view, right? This is not official history. This is Jeanette's, uh, Jeanette's view of how things uh, worked. But um, in a sense, the experience with SARS gave us something to, a model to recognize the current reality against. It's almost exactly what we do scenario planning, except we had a real scenario, which was SARS. Uh, and so when the, the, when the early signs um, of COVID showed up, our spider senses went off and we were like, mm, I think we've seen something like this before and uh, maybe we need to take a closer look and be worried about it. And that's why we responded quickly. And we also had a playbook um, from having learned from SARS what you needed to do uh, yeah. that we could start our COVID response with. We very rapidly realized that although SARS and COVID have some similarities. They are not the same kind of disease. And, and the, the disruption they cause is not the same kind of disruption. Unlike SARS, COVID is extremely global. And so the long tail challenges in terms of economic and so social challenges are completely different than the SARS experience. And we have to learn as we go. Um, and that's where some of the experiential uh, learning instincts kick in. Um, 
pity Aaron had to go so we could have had this debate. But I was thinking about it as he was speaking and saying that we live in a sandbox now because in a sense, all of our lockdowns and our circuit breakers are an attempt to press pause on this disease as we learn about it and how to deal with it. But it's also a way for us to try things that we've been talking about and have never managed to do. Working from home, home-based learning for our children, we've, we've been forced to do all of that. And being forced to do all of that, we learn that there are benefits, but there are also costs. Costs that we don't see until we attempt to step through the whole process. And this is the futures at the national level versus futures at the personal level problem, right? At the national grand scale, we can describe this beautiful future where everybody works from home, nobody needs to commute, we don't have to consume so much greenhouse, we don't have to produce so much greenhouse gas and we can all live in a beautiful space. But in reality, not everybody can do that. And what kinds of, of, of problems and what kinds of inequalities inadvertently get uh, put on the full display as a result of some of these things. Uh, we were talking about working from home and, um, um, and about learning at home this morning in another meeting that we had. And it's a little ironic that the, the move to digital, to, to tele everything, has almost re-emphasized how important physical spaces are. If you live in a small house, if you have crappy internet, you cannot participate fully in this digital world then whose responsibility is it to make sure that you have space to do what you need to do, that you have infrastructure and resources? Who looks after the poor children? Who looks after the squeezed adults? These all become public policy questions that you didn't have to ask before, but now you've seen it and you've experienced it. You can't not deal with it. That was a bit of uh, my rambly response to that question. No, that, that, that's great. Um, I might even feed this into the next couple of questions um, from the, the Q&A. Uh, the, the, for Chofan, one, one asked to, to, if you could unpack the, the, this idea of the need for agility and this hinge of history. Um, where do we think we need to move quickly to grasp the opportunity or position ourselves to learn as things emerge, which I think builds on what Jeanette's just said. Um, and, and there's a second question from Christopher, which I think is limited, which is what are the costs and the opportunities involved when one toggles between Kairos and Kronos in this sort of, in this period? So I don't know wow. if you want to... Christopher's question is really, really deep, actually. So uh, let, me, let me try here, and uh, let me try to explain to perhaps an example. So it's a little bit more, uh, less abstract, perhaps, here. So going back to the climate change uh, piece that, uh, that I mentioned as an example fairly early, all right, so what I started to reference was how did um, economies or societies um, handle the different sorts of uh, climate extremes that they went through. And you just have to say, uh, it's a little ice age, so it'd be, very, it'd be a bit different for Singapore, but what, what is it? So the military historian, uh, Jeffrey Parker, he wrote a really good book, so you should just go check it out, people. Okay, on the second and third order effects of uh, the little ice age of the 17th century. Now that was <laughs> no walk in the park, it wiped out about a third of the global population then, and it triggered uh, what is quite well known as the 30 years war in Europe and in, over in Asia, uh, the Ming Dynasty was, was already tottering, all right? It was destroyed, actually. It was destroyed and uh, we saw quite a lot of apocalyptic cult flourishing. So you just, you get a sense of what, um, what, what is the sort of like, you know, the ground unrest, if you wish. But um, uh, so talking about now Kairos, right? Kairos, the guy with the, you know, you know, the balances there, all right, who's winning and who's losing. So what are the states that thrive and, and actually did well, not just survived, but did well. So one of them that I was really curious about was the Dutch Republic. And you know, this coincides very well with also the golden age of the Dutch, right? Because it became the world's preeminent naval and financial power. And we saw the Spanish, okay. Why, why was it that? Because if you look at it, you could see that the Spanish were hindered uh, by size. In this case, uh, actually the size of the galleons. Okay, while well, the Dutch actually invented uh, skippers, really small, agile ships. And, uh, and by the way, the business model was called piracy. Okay, and you could raise funds quickly. Uh, which well, they also invented, they also invented the company, didn't they? That's right, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. How can we yeah. all participate in this piracy in a nice way, you know? Okay, and this is it. So, well, compared to the Spanish, they were hindered by size and legacy to the crown and all that. So that, that just got me thinking, it's like, what are tomorrow's winners be like? So uh, you have carbon legacy systems that weigh down 
economies, uh, okay, like like those of in the United States, okay, or Australia, and those of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and I'm not yes, all right. And then what what are what are who's coming out with not just the technology for the systems of financing for a post carbon society? We definitely see that in Europe. We also see that for very different reasons uh, in the PRP as well. So that's that's the Dutch. Okay, that's a Dutch lesson if you wish. Then go over to another winner. The a surprising winner here was Tokugawa era Japan, all right, uh, or what you call Edo, all right, Edo era Japan. And it adopted a very different thing. It adopted a fortress strategy. So Japan prior to that was pretty open, but in, to, in, response, in response actually to the drought and the roaming bands or what they call uh, wandering samurai without master, Ronin, all right, it developed a very centralized power structure and performance legitimacy was essentially stability, plus disaster preparedness. So actually at the center, if there was a disaster, say a far off, uh, not province, they call it a prefecture, all right? Okay, they'll send the guys there, they will settle it, etc. But in return, in return, you had to, of course, to uh, give so much of your uh, produce from your land over, as well as so many men, but even more crucially, uh, they froze social mobility. So the idea of a caste system, okay? And they're very rigid, different levels, how you behave, your in and out and so on that that uh, uh, that characterizes modern Japanese society. Actually, a lot of it started taking shape during Tokugawa era Japan. They had to free social mobility because otherwise, with a lot of social dynamism, society was so creaky it could not take it. It was very interesting, a very different approach. They also froze innovation. So you remember there was also a time where they had the uh, thing in English they called they just steal themselves out from the outside world as well. So, so the Meiji then restoration. You say, well, yes, until the Meiji restoration with the black ships coming in, all right, in 1857 or something like that, I think. So that so you have different you have different things to learn from. And then if I had so in this hinges of history, I think one thing to do is uh, and we talk about this a conniving framework often is please don't react immediately, all right. Uh, so that so don't react immediately. Try to see the deeper pattern there. Okay, and uh, you send off little, you do little small trials and you see the response and you start to get a good sense what happened. But I have to also uh, uh, caution that in these times, right, a new, a new uh, Kairos, so to speak, a new structure of the new world doesn't happen immediately. So for, uh, for the little ice age, it took a good part of a few decades. And if you want to talk about pandemics, the Black Age, all right, the Black Age, uh, or the Black Death, I'm going to the Black Age, the Black Death, that also coincided with a, uh, with a little bit of climate change around that time. The emergence of a new world came about after about six or seven decades, if I remember correctly, uh, and that led to the Renaissance and all that. So what should a society do during that time? Okay, of course you have the husband, you have the husband resources, but also have to also put, take a lot of bets like the way the Dutch did. Okay, but Tokugawa era Japan's strategy was also correct. But it's a very particular thing because it was an island nation. It could choose to do that. The Dutch could not choose to do that. So once again, you have to contextualize and see what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. So I'll just stop there first. Yeah. No, that's that, that's that's brilliant. And uh, I, I imagine we could we could. There's a whole other hour we could have on on actually how countries learn from other countries in, through history. Um, and I wish we'd done that one now. <laughs> um, look, we are, we, we're getting very close to time. Um, so um, unfortunately, uh, this feels like a dinner party that should go on for a while, um, but we know we're gonna, we're gonna, people are gonna have to, to, to leave. So I just wanted to uh, give everyone a bit of a chance for a final sort of 30 second um, pitch. And uh, you, you can have a choice. You can uh, either, one thing that you're taking into the future, from now, so from this period, what are you taking from now into the future? Uh, or 30 seconds for your personal hope for Singapore, or 30 seconds to share with us your favorite dessert. This is the dessert part of the dinner, so. <laughs> so, what are you taking? That is the a tough the choice. Now? Or future for Singapore, or dessert recipes? Go. <laughs> that is a tough choice. Okay, I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, what am I going to take from now into the future? We were talking about this uh, yesterday uh, in a separate chat about how, um, what an embodied futures practice is like. And I'm sure all of you saw as my, my younger daughter came in here to ask me for dessert and wandered off again. Um, 
But I think what I've learned from this period dealing with COVID and having my kids underfoot all the time is that the future that I think about every day is going to be their, their reality, their daily life. When they are in their 30s, I'm going to be a retiree, hopefully on a beach somewhere, and they will rule the world. So what are the skill sets? What are the things they need to know? What are the things they need to do today to be able to live in that future, which, as Chopin pointed out, might still be a somewhat chaotic, unstable one even 30 years from now, um, is the problem that plagues my daily life. And hopefully I will crack it sometime before they turn, they turn 30. <laughs> I'm going to lob this one to Cheryl. Cheryl. Um, I think for me, one thing I'm taking away from this time, uh, I mean, we run a, a training and consulting business, basically. Uh, you know, and of course, this, this period has been a very significant pivot uh, for us. Uh, but I think the thing that's been, been preoccupying my mind is this idea of learning, not just being an individual thing, but also a, a social and community thing. And how do you preserve that aspect of it uh, in, in executive education programs, but, you know, kind of more generally and more broadly. So I think the thing that, that I'm really taking away is, is really this idea of community, right? And, and kind of coming together that the different parts of society have, have different roles to play. Um, I think even when we talk about this conversation, even though we've taken a very public, public sector and futures bias, you know, it's by no means the only way of learning, uh, you know, or the only, only view of the future. And I think this idea of really how to, to uh, make that into a much more inclusive uh, practice to me has, has been the thing that's just been preoccupying my mind during this period. Me too. <laughs> Chofan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I might talk about pangolins, actually. Yeah, okay, hi, Uncle Chofan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's the idea, and I think if anything, all right, I, I think uh, history has been, uh, I talked a little bit about this on the chat yesterday, almost a bit too human-centered, a bit too human-centered. If anything right now, we should share a lot of humility, okay, that a virus is actually throwing our world really, really upside down. And to actually start to understand that it's not so much a, uh, what's the word, human-centered history, it's the Anthropocene, so much actually is actually the, the world of um, biocene. I know, I'm making this up, microbiocene or whatever it is. All right, the history is not just made by humans, but history is actually made by a lot of non-human beings. And through our actions, we are interacting a lot with it. This is not just about climate change. This is also about the different synthetic intelligences that we are going to create fairly soon. Okay, and how do we start to live with it in this big mash, so to speak, right? And how do we then reconceive where we are and what is our agency? And it could be a shrinking one, okay, in this world of viruses and machines and machine intelligences. And, but also to take heart that actually it is all not so new that humans have managed to find agency, but maybe not the same human, okay? They managed to find uh, human beings, okay? Have managed to find agency, meaning, and purpose out of it, okay? And uh, in the longer run of things, longer run of things, it does work out in the wash. So uh, have a lot, have a lot more faith. We are still around. Okay, we are still around. Uh, that's a uh, very. Dessert, uh, I don't eat dessert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you for that, Shofana. Thank you, uh, all of you, for those contributions. I think it's a very nice, optimistic note to end on. Um, I do look forward to the Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, uh, executive education program on pangolin-centered design. I expect to see that uh, hitting, the, hitting the shelves very, very soon. Um, look, uh, it's been a far, far too short a dinner. Um, I look forward to doing it with you guys in person sometime soon. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much uh, and um, uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Um, and hopefully we can continue these conversations over the, the coming, uh, coming days. Good night. Thank you. Uh, get home Bye, safely. Everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Stay healthy. <laughs>